we said that we were going to do on February 14th, I believe. It was on the radio. This is what we were going to talk about. And then our friend Denny Weiss from the DNR, retired from Bellevue, heard it on the radio and said, hey, I'll come and bring all my beaver things. And he is so awesome. And he knows so much that I can tell you that's from that lunch I ever gave. Because he did the whole he did the whole thing for us and he was he was so so interesting. He's such a great guy. And he kind of made the groundwork for what we're gonna talk about today. Okay? So first of all, that is not John Henry right there that you see because as far as we know there aren't any pictures of John Henry, but this is kind of what I think he might have might have looked like our, our mountain man. But before, I want to show you this, okay? This is Annabelle Wacker. Many of you, I think, knew her. She was a longtime curator from Bellevue, longtime curator of the Jackson County Historical Society. So back in the day, I'm sure that you all became well acquainted with her. And I think that I had just come here, I think maybe in the early 2000s, I think I intended a ceremony, a, a, a program in honor of her at Bellevue where she was named the official Bellevue historian by the city of Bellevue. And uh, she, I put some information there about her, but she's just a really wonderful lady. By the time I came, she wasn't coming to Makokoda much anymore. But anytime we had a problem, we needed information, she was right there to help us, and I, I really appreciate her. Um, the reason I'm excited about this is because Friday, an archivist from Morris College came to me, and she gave us all, I think all, the existing research that Annabelle Wacker did two years about Bellevue, et cetera. Um, it had been given to the Morris College, Morris College decided that it was more suitable to have it here because it's Jackson County history, lots and lots of Bellevue history. And so I thought, boy, this is just this is just awesome. That this would appear just when we're talking about John Henry Weber from Bellevue. And so last night I went over and I went through these boxes of things and I found the notebook that was supposed to have all his information in it. There was a, a yellow sticky tag saying this is where it is. And there was nothing there about John Henry. And so somebody evidently had taken it out to use it. Hopefully we'll find it somewhere else in the collection. But I was I was really disappointed because I thought I was going to have more and better information about him to tell you today. Now, Judy Kilburn has done a lot of research on him and tried to find out about him. He's kind of a mystery person, but then again, it was a long time ago. And uh, so anyway, we're, we're still talking about it. Okay, so I would just throw out go ahead, there. please. I took four classes under Annabelle, and she was a wonderful teacher. But a motto she used to use often if you were at a cemetery is, consider what you're going to do with your dash, from the birth to the death. That's, uh, consider what you're going to do with your dash in life. In life, that's really neat. <laughs> She, she was also a good friend of Bell Tucker's, and when, when I came back and I had questions, there were certain people I always went to, and she and Bell Tucker were right at the top of my list, because if it was Jackson County history, they, they knew about it. Okay, so today we are talking about John Henry Weber, and that's not him either. <laughs> anyway, we, we know that there's, there's no, no pictures of him. So, a quote to you. Um, his name is better known to the residents of Utah than Jackson County, Iowa, but explorer John Henry Weber is more than deserving of induction into the Jackson County Historical Society of Hall of Fame. Now that was written by another Bellevue person, Sarah Milhouse, who was the former editor of the Bellevue Herald newspaper. And she prepared a paper about him and brought it to us to nominate him to the Hall of Fame. And she didn't know but he was already in our Hall of Fame. He um, had been inducted in 1988, and he was nominated by Mike Jones, who some of you remember, he was a former member of the Jackson County Economic Commission. So John Henry Weber has been in our Hall of Fame for some time, and we're still desperately trying to learn more about him, but he was kind of a mystery. So he, we know that he, that's going back a long way, we know that he was born in 1779 in Altona, 
which was near Hamburg, Germany. And at that time, it was part of the country of Denmark. It was under the rule of Denmark at that time. So he got a great education as a young man. Um, and as a young man, he, a, he ran off to sea, to the, to, to the sea. And by the time he was 21 years old, we have documentation that he was the captain of a passenger ship and that he commanded sailing vessels for nearly six years during a very dangerous time as England and France were always at war. And um, he eventually ended up being a captain in the Danish Navy. So he had lots and lots of experience as a very young man. He came, up, he came to America in 1810, again a very long time ago, and he settled um, in St. Genevieve, Missouri, and some of you probably know that was the oldest permanent settlement west of the Mississippi before that, that territory had been opened up to settling. He, um, like I say, he had a very good education. Not everybody was well educated back in that day. And so there in St. Genevieve, he was quickly hired by the U.S. Army Ordnance Department to keep the records of the government-owned lead mines that were there. And in 1822, he met two interesting men, William Ashley and Major Andrew Henry. And they were fur trade speculators. And according to the Alice 1910 history, Ashley was the rich man who furnished the outfit. And the outfit, and this is the exploring outfit, um, consisted of two keelboats loaded with provisions, firearms, traps, ammunition, and other necessities. So they're following up on the Lewis and Clark expedition, right? And they're on a, they're on a mission from Thomas Jefferson. Um, the, these three men <coughs> or, organized a 50-person expedition up the Missouri River, and they became the first American trappers to ever cross the, Ameri the Continental Divide. Now, this group contains some people who are pretty famous in history. Um, besides our John Henry, there was Jim Bridger, who I'm sure you've heard about, Jedediah Smith, the Sublet brothers, and some others. And these were what became known as the Mountain Men. These are the men that, that explored and settled the West. Well, Ashley, who, was in, who took one part of the crew, and he went up the Missouri River to the, up the Missouri to the Milk River, and they appointed John Henry Weber to lead the Yellowstone Party, the Yellowstone River Party. So he was in charge. He was the head of this party. And we're told that a lot of this came from the Ellis, the Ellis history, that he was a large and powerful man. He was well suited to the outdoors, a real outdoors man. But by then, John Henry was in his early 40s. He was caught up in an adventure with much younger men, because the mountain men were young guys. And most of them, when they went to the mountains, were in their 20s or very early 30s. And not many of them, because it was such a hard and dangerous life, not many of them were even reached John Henry's age. Um, the, dis the size of the detachment that he was in co control of was always over 25 men. Sometimes it was early as 50 men. These men were, were trappers. They were trapping beaver. They were trapping otter and things for the fur trade. And they were joined from time to time that his group got bigger and, and smaller from time to time because they were joined by men that were called free traders. And the free traders usually worked alone. They, they were just mountain men, hermits, they went on, out on their own, they, they collected beaver pelts and things, and the only time that they joined a, a, a unit, like John Henry's unit, is when there were hostile Indians around and, and their safety in numbers. So they would all come together and work together at that time. Um, but we know that Weber often wintered with his men in a camp that was just a few miles from the Shoshone camp and that somehow he had earned their respect, and they never bothered his, his party of trappers. John Henry had great qualities of leadership. That's why he was chosen to, by these two men. Um, he, something like that, sorry. He, um, he 
He was known for his ability to survive in the harsh wilderness. While in his 20s, like we said, he had been in the Royal Navy, so he had learned to be a navigator. And he could tell from the stars and from his personal sense of direction, he always knew where he was, longitudinally and latitudinally. And he traveled through these uncharted territories in our Rocky Mountains and in the West that had not been explored at all. And he could orient himself in places that most men couldn't. And at times when they couldn't see familiar peaks and things like that, he just had the advantage of always knowing where he was. So he was a very good guy. These men laid out trails. Um, they, they found the Indian trails and then they expanded on those. They um, mapped the area. Those were the first maps that the United States government had of that part of, of, of our country. And another thing that made him so important was that he had very good judgment. He had no fear of danger, um, but he was wise enough, even though he had no fear of danger, he was wise enough to know when to avoid danger. He didn't look for trouble. Um, J.W. Ellis, in his, in his book, described him as having the courage, the courage of a hero and the staying qualities of a martyr. And those who knew him, and those who knew him described him as having just just being a, uh, this most remarkable leader that always had the answer, that always knew the right thing to do, and no one ever knew him to experience a sensation of fear. So this is a map of the travels that Weber's group took. You can see where he started out in Missouri, and he went all the way up almost to the Canadian border, the river, and then they came back down. Um, they traveled through Jackson Hole, Wyoming, down the Green River, and into Haida Hole's Cache Valley. And from there, they descended into the Great Basin. And in the fall of 1824, he reportedly became the first white man to enter into the Great Salt Lake Valley. Now, as, his, in, as in history, there's always another version. He had a young man with him by the name of Jim Richard, who became way more famous in the history of the mountain man than our guy was. Um, he claimed to have taken a bed at one time, and he took a bull boat, and he descended alone down this treacherous river, um, and that he was the first person to view the lake, and then the rest of them went down later. So, you know, you never know for sure just what happened, but there's a lot of evidence out there that John Henry Weber was the first person in to the Great Salt Lake Valley, first white man to view that. Um, at that time, Captain Weber, like I said, would have been in his early 40s. Jim Bridger would have been 19 years old. So almost everybody was, was, was much younger than he. And living such a hard life, it, that would be an important thing. Um, as Sarah Milhouse in her article put it, history is a winner takes all game. And that's kind of true. And Jim Bridger turned out historically to kind of be one of the winners of fame and fortune. He's the man that you read about in a lot of things. His name was then more prominent throughout history. She said that Weber was one of the losers. He remained more in the shadows, though he was more responsible, we could tell, did more of hard work and deserved more of the honor. He was more in the background. Well, in 1827, yet a very long time ago, he returned to St. Louis. He moved to Galena and then eventually to Bellevue. And by the time he got there, it was said by his family that he had been cheated out of his share of the expedition's proceeds, and he died a very poor man. Um, reportedly, he had made over $20,000, a long time, a lot of money, in the early 1800s by tapping beaver and honor. But whoever history has chosen, our captain, John Henry Weber, was indeed one of the most prominent members and he deserves to be remembered for the significant role he played in settling the American West. From the Great Salt Lake, they followed the tributaries, and they even named the largest other tributaries after John Henry Weber. We know that he attended the, most, the first rendezvous that was organized by Ashley, that was one of his partners. And it was near the present day McKinnon, McKinnon Wyoming, and it was in 1825. And they chose the name Rendezvous, this was the first one ever, because it meant two things. 
it meant a place and a, an appointed time. And so all of these mountain men, the word would spread throughout the, throughout the whole area, and they knew that the place and the time they needed to be with their furs, that they could turn in their furs, um, and that they could get supplies and things, but before they'd kind of been on their own. Um, and so, so dozens and dozens and dozens of them met there. At this first rendezvous that was really, really famous, there were 191 fur packs turned in. Each one was worth $1,000 in pelts. They were brought in by trappers from, that came in from the Indian country. And the Indians had trapped a lot of these as well. They know that, that anywhere from 75,000 to 200,000, that's a, that's a big range, worth of pelts were taken to them by the Hudson Bay Company, which was a competitor. So that's kind of a mysterious thing that there doesn't seem to be an answer to. And not even Ashley, who was the head of that, attempted to account for them. But again, this was a whole new dimension. It was a way for, for these trappers to get their furs out, to get supplies in. And so it was really a, a very big deal. Um, we know that Weber was there. We know that he worked for Ashley and Henry. And the name of the, the, name of the fur company that, that they were, the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, that was one, um, one of three. Um, we know that he participated in these rendezvous because he was an employee, for sure, from 1825 and 1826 and 1827. But we also know that after the 1827 rendezvous, uh, he returned to the Midwest. And he came back with a caravan hauling first to market. We're not sure why he came back. There's lots of, lots of reasons speculated. But at that time, he quit trapping and he came back. Um, Weber's party during that time had searched out and mapped all of the old Indian trails, and those later became part of the Oregon Trail, the Mormon Trail, all of the ways through the early west. And they were followed by then the same path, pathways, were followed by the railroads, and later by the highways, and then by the pipelines. <coughs> so the routes that, that he took a great part in discovering and laying out. Um, through all this treacherous territory, these high mountains in this rugged territory, became the quickest way to move people and goods and information from the East Coast to the West Coast. So you can just kind of see how important what he did was. Okay, so back to 1927, we know that he trapped for five years, and then he definitely left the mountain. Um, there are no real clues, like I said, as to why. At the time, he think, we think he would have been 48 years old, really an old man to be doing that kind of thing. Um, we also know that his friend, Andrew Henry, the, other, the third partner, had left the year before. So he returned to St. Genevieve, where he got reacquainted with his family. So he had married a French woman by the name of Clementine in 1815, and together they had seven children this whole time that he was gone, she had seven children. His son William had been born the first year of his absence. So John returned, he was very quickly hired back to his old job um, at, the lead, at the lead mines because of his former performance, he did such a great job. But then, in 1833, he moved his family to Galena. And in Galena, he became assistant superintendent in the Galena lead mines. And pretty soon after he'd been there a while, he was made superintendent. So he was obviously a very accomplished man. He was actually he was obviously very capable of doing really good things. Um, in, 19, in 1844, John Henry Weber and his and his family retired to Bellevue, and that's how he got to Bellevue. And there he spent the remainder of his life. Um, so 1844 Bellevue, you remember that would be four years after the Bellevue War, pretty early in Bellevue history. The county seat was still there, that meant the courthouse was there, the whole center of, of our county government was in Bellevue. And while there, after he had retired, he performed clerical work in different county offices, and he also clerked for several Bellevue merchants and just made his home in Bellevue. Um, we know that in 1850, I think I have these out of order. In 1850, he was living with his son William um, 
on a small parcel of land on Duck Creek. And it's just interesting, we know now that um, Daryl Parker of the DNR owns that piece of land now. So he, he lived right on Duck Creek on this little piece of land. Also what we found out about John Henry Wimmer that's a little bit sad, is that though his whole life he'd been a very impetuous man, he had a volatile nature and if he went up and down with hope and despair, maybe a little like manic depressive or, or something along those orders. So he battled with that, I guess, most of his life. Um, and some of these aspects of his personality <coughs> probably contributed to his tragic end, um, the tragic end of his life, because in February of 1859, he committed suicide at the age of 80. He had been under painful suffering. He had what then was called neuralgia of the face. It was extremely painful and he evidently just decided he could not deal with that anymore and so he ended it. We know that he is buried in the North Bellevue Cemetery, so that's the same as Republic, right? Republic Cemetery in Bellevue. Um, we know that there's no stone or marker at his grave site, the grave site of this remarkable man who was one of our county's first pioneers and, and just did so much for the, our great Western Empire. Empire, um, the discovery of the Great Salt Lake, etc. And in Bellevue, each summer for a long time, and I have to ask Jean, I don't know if it's still happening, but they had the Mountain Inn Rendezvous in Bellevue for years. Do they still have that? Not that I'm aware of. Maybe not right now. Okay. But that, that Mountain Inn Rendezvous was named after him. Does anybody know if that's still happening? It was up to just a very few years ago it was still happening. But that, that was named after him. Um, Little Park in Bellevue, I believe, is named after him. Other than that, there is very little mention of him in our neck of the woods. But, as I say, he's a very famous man in Utah. So what you see there is um, a, a certificate that was given when his great-granddaughter, great-granddaughter, um, unveiled a monument of him in Ogden in the city municipal gardens. And this took place in 1991. That's Ogden, Utah. You see a little bit of the park, and you see the the plaque that is there for him. And I think that I put a close up of it, and whoops, doesn't look very clear, does it? Sorry. So, but that is one of the many, many, many plaques and statues in Utah that that commemorates him. Um, we know that during the time that he spent the winter of 1825-26 in the Salt Lake Valley, during that time, the, the very large Weber River uh, in Utah is named after him. There's Weber, only, only in Utah it's pronounced Weber, okay? They spell it the same, W-E-B-E-R, but it's pronounced Weber out there. So there's Weber City, there's Weber River, there's Weber County. There's Weaver State University, there's Weaver Canyon, and there's even a type of sandstone named after him. Lots and lots of parks and monuments and statues, like the one that, the one that you see here. So it's just amazing that the people in Utah remember, but the people in Jackson County, where he came back to, we don't have very much. So I'm very, very glad that he's in our Hall of Fame and that we can talk to him from time to time. So just a little bit, that is just a picture of um, what, it, what it looked like out there. And I'm sure it looked very much the same then as it does now. But the mountain men, you know, made up a really colorful chapter of our history. They were important from 1820s to 1840s. That's kind of when they did their thing. I know that there's a museum in Wyoming called the Museum of the Mountain Man, because my brother goes there all the time. Um, so it's just a, a really big deal out there. But this all started when the French came. They began trading with the Indians, were trying to make friends with the Indians, and they were giving them little trinkets and things, trading them for pelts. While at the same time, the fur trade was becoming really, really important in Europe because the Europeans had this craze for beaver hats. And I brought a few beaver hats from our collection up there. They were, they were status symbols for the classes. You could tell by the hat a person wore, maybe what his occupation was, certainly his, his kind of 
the status and rank in the country was by the hat they wore. And this went for women as well as men. So when the Europeans had, had trapped almost every beaver there was in the area, and in Russia to make all of these wonderful beaver hats and things, they were excited to find, find the American West that had seemingly an unlimited supply. And so the companies, the companies were formed here. The American companies were, like I said, the Rock, Rocky Mountain Fur Company that John Henry was with, and the American Fur Company that, that belonged to the, the millionaire Astor. But the Hudson Bay Company, which I know you all heard of, um, Hudson Bay Company was from Canada. They were the oldest and the largest company, and they were able to undercut the other two. So we're told that that um, they just kind of took over, forced the other two out of business. And they're still in business today. You can look them up on the internet. They sell beautiful fur hats and, and things like that, and they have retail, retail stores, that sort of thing. Um, the 1840 rendezvous was the very last one, and by, by 1841, the American companies both were in ruins. This may be partly why John Henry didn't get all the money that he had coming. I mean, even though there was a distance of time there, that may have had something to do with it. Um, we know that in 1826, there were between five and 600 trappers or mountain men in the West but that was in 1926. In 1846, 20 years later, there were less than 50. So you can see how it went downhill. The demand from Europe was less. They had gone into other fashions and things like that. The beaver hats were no longer what they were. Um, and again, they had overhunted the beaver here as well. And so it just kind of went by the wayside. I looked up something. Um, Kind of looking into the beaver hats that we have in the museum and things like that. The process of making the hats is really fa fascinating. Um, they only used the fur. They didn't use the hide, the beaver hide, like we tan leather. They didn't use the beaver hide. That was news to me. They used the fur. And it was a very complex, multi-step fashion. And they, they would do the whole process in one <coughs> closed building which became a very bad thing, because they soaked the pelts in a solution of mercury oxide, and that made the fur come off the hide easier. Well, they're in this closed room. It was a closed room because the, the underneath fur, like the down of a chicken, the underneath fur that was the most desirable was light and fluffy, and they had a draft through there, an open window or something, it all blew around. So they were in a real closed, Situation, and that's how the old expression <coughs> came about mad as a hatter or the mad hatter because this mercury poisoning just affected all of these many, many people that were working in this industry and it affected their central nervous system and they became mad as they were called back then. So uh, that's, where the, that's where mad as a hatter came from. Um, I just wanted to show you quickly. This is our this is our exhibit. Marcella Henneke worked so hard on this. This is our exhibit um, at the other museum. I hope you'll go in and see it. We do not get our bigger coats in. Oh, that's not at all clear. Sue, Sue, I think can you adjust that a little bit? I think I just didn't adjust the thing. Just the slide part. No, that's the wrong. Um, maybe I don't know. Anyway, that's not very clear. It's very clear on my computer. We don't get our furs out, thank you, I. We don't get our furs out very much. I mean, first of all, it's a hassle, but they need to be gotten out from time to time, refolded and put away. So this is a good time this winter to get everything out and um, and put it on display. So we hope that you will you will take a look at all of this. Um, the bill the. The beaver pelt that's on the circular thing, that was donated by Joanne Cabin many years ago. So that's always over at the museum. Something that, one thing you can touch there is the, is the beaver to see how, how soft and everything it is. And there should be little tags that kind of tell you where most of these, most of these things came, came from. But we have some really interesting beaver gloves and, and uh, things like that that really tell the story. And then something that I didn't take pictures of 
We have three enormous men's coats, fur coats. And we're trying to figure them out a little bit. They're all very different from each other. One we know belonged to Shad Burleson. Um, it's a, we believe, a buffalo coat that um, he, had, he had made. We have a bear coat. And then we have a coat that, that Mr. Giddings that's made. And it's, it's kind of a curly fur, so we're just not sure what's what. And we, I had Denny Meese look at him last week, and he gave us his, his best opinion, but he just didn't know about those. But these coats, you should really look at them. They're, as time goes by, even though we're doing our best to take really good care of them, you know, nature, they just, because of time, they just naturally degrade no matter what you do. So they're getting more and more frail, but these coats are so heavy. And we know the stories of Shad Burleson, for instance, that, that lived at Buckhorn Inn. Remember, he had the Buckhorn Inn. And he would walk from Buckhorn across the frozen Mississippi to Galena, which was the only place that they could get supplies, wearing in the winter, he had to cross on the frozen river, and he wore that huge coat. That I, I think weighed 50 pounds, that coat. Was, I mean, I'm sure he didn't get cold, but boy, was that coat heavy. You had to be a heck of a man to even wear one of those things, I think, because they were so heavy. So I do hope that you will stop and look at those. Um, they'll be on display probably till near the 1st of May. But I wanted to show you this. This is what we're calling, this is what we're calling the mystery coat. <laughs> Sorry. I can't remember. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I should pay attention to that. Um, we call this the mystery coat because when we were getting all these coats out over there from our textile closet upstairs, because as you know, every museum has most of what they own put away. Only parts of things are on display at, at one time. This coat appeared, and it was very nicely put away in a big gray archival box. We got it out, and it's just the most gorgeous coat. So Denny Weiss told us, I thought that was Rabbitsburg. Denny Weiss told us that was fox, the, the trim, and it goes all around the corner. It's a full-length coat. It goes down all the front of the coat. It goes around the sleeves. It's just gorgeous. The material, which you can't see very much of there, is um, it's like a pale gold velvet almost, the material of the coat. The lining, you can see a little bit, is in very, very fragile shape. But if you look at, if you look up here, this is just exquisite beading in pale, different shades, different colors of beads, pinks and blues and yellows exquisite BB. And then, if you open the coat, the lining on the inside of the coat is beautifully embroidered. This is not a pattern material. This is embroidery that's on this coat. And it's just, I took, okay, so, I'm sorry I don't have that clear. So, the beading on the outside, on the cuffs and the hands and up by the collar, and then this beautiful embroidery. It's almost a Cool embroidery, is that what you might call it? Beautiful embroidery all up and down the coat. The tragedy is, we don't know whose coat that was. Somehow, the paperwork is just not there. And we don't know who wore this coat, who donated this coat. We know nothing about this beautiful, beautiful coat. But we do think that this is a Jackson County coat that the family that this coat belonged to at least the stories must have come down through the family, right? Of great grandma or grandma or somebody who had this beautiful coat. And maybe somewhere in an old scrapbook, there's a picture of someone wearing this gorgeous coat. Because it's not just an ordinary coat, as you can tell. So this is our mystery coat. And it's on display over there. We're trying to find out anything we can about who might have worn. I mean, it's something you would expect a Hollywood actress to get out of the limousine wearing or, you know, something like that, going to the Oscars or something, you know. It's just absolutely gorgeous. So, if you 
hear of anybody who had things like this in their family. I, I immediately thought maybe of Jean Buckner, because Jean came from Michigan and her family was a very classy family and she had a lot of beautiful, beautiful things. So, I don't know, we're just hoping. Hoping you can help us find out who this who this coat might have belonged to because it is beautiful. But please stop over at the other museum sometime between now and and the first part of May and take a look at this because once we put it away we'll not probably get it out for a while. I, I just went went to the Hudson Bay website. Uh -huh. The website is called thebay.com. They don't even it doesn't even mention anything about hats. Oh I I looked I've looked I've looked. I've, you know, there's lots of places to look. And I have seen that they have for hats for hunters, the kind that you know, come way down. They have all kinds of fur things still for sale that, that they sell. That, you know. And then they have, they just have a lot of online stores and they have stores in some of the huge shopping malls and things. They have out. They have stores, and then I would think that in places like in some of the European places, or maybe the Russian places where it's very cold, cold winters, more so than ours, that, that these things are still available, though that we don't have them in our country. So, anyway, John Henry Weber, John Henry Weber, however you choose to say his name, he too is a mystery man. We're trying to find out more about him. We're trying to find out exactly where he's buried in the cemetery. We're trying to find out there's there's no stone of any kind. Though I will say that the Bellevue Herald published an article about him at one time and they showed a picture of a stone next to the article. It was a very, very old stone that you could barely read anymore. It was not his. He doesn't have one, but it led you to believe that there might have been one, you know, or that that, that might be the one. But um Anyway, anything that, and I, I was very hopeful that Annabelle just had all kinds of answers for us in this research that we just got, but didn't work out that way. He doesn't have a wife or children near in that cemetery either, really, or? Jeannie, do you know anyone? I do not know that either. We don't think that he has, we don't know that he has any relatives still here. Um, but seven children, there's, there's got to be somebody somewhere, right? But, um, but certainly, certainly an important man in our history did did much for the settling of the country. Any other comments before we close? All right. Thank you very much for coming, and please go take a look at the fur coats.